In this video, I'm going to go over uh, the proof of case three from our 1.4 introduction activity that we did in Zoom class yesterday. So if um, zero is less than x less than y, we need to show that there's a rational number r that sits between them. So I'm dealing with the case where both x and y are positive. Um, and before I start this case to try to give you some intellectual necessity for why case three is different from case two. Let's take a look at case two real quick. So recall in case two, that's the case where x is zero and y is a positive number. And you should have discussed with your group that this is really just the Archimedean property uh, part two. The Archimedean property part two says there has to exist a little n uh, such that zero is less than one over n, which is less than y, and and oh yay, that's a rational number. So we can just use r to be one over n. And this here, you know, we are applying the Archimedean property part two to say there has to exist an n in the natural numbers such that zero is less than one over n, which is less than y, but remember zero is just our x value. Okay, now when I move to case three, we have the following picture. So I've got zero right here, but now X and Y are floating off somewhere else on the number line. Maybe they're there. I don't know how far apart exactly they are. I just know that both of them lie to the right of zero and I'm making the assumption that Y is further right than X. Now, if I were to try to, uh, I mean, these are positive numbers. So if I were to try to apply the Archimedean property like I did in case two and try to get a one over N, the issue is what about the case where say X and Y are both bigger than one? Cause then if you get a one over N, one over N would be, you know, we know the largest that can be is one or, and then it's just a half, a third, et cetera, and moves towards zero zero and the issue is this is not it's rational but it's not between x and y and so it's not as simple as just applying the Archimedean property here we have to do something else so instead what we're going to do is if one step size of size 1 over n isn't enough to get us between x and y, we can keep adding copies of, of 1 over n. In other words, taking multiple steps of size 1 over n, kind of like subintervals, until we land in between x and y. So I'm going to redraw this picture because I don't know necessarily that you know x and y are both bigger than one. They may not be. One might be smaller or both could be smaller than one. I want to give a generic argument. So the way this, what I'm doing is related to um, stepping in a puddle is you can imagine a guy, he's standing here at zero and his goal is to come over and step in the puddle. The puddle is exactly the interval between x and y. So here is our puddle. And we know that if someone is taking equal sized steps and they wanna guarantee they don't step over the puddle, they need those um, step sizes to be uh, smaller than the width of the puddle. So in this case, the width is y minus x. So we need step sizes smaller than y minus x. So I measure that width and then I just make sure that I'm using subintervals like this that are smaller so that I'm guaranteed that, oh, I finally step inside here. This is uh, my, my mth step of size one over n. So this is m over n here. If I say this is one over n, two over n, etc. 
I don't know how many steps I need to take to get in there because as X and Y change, that's going to vary. But um, I believe, you know, just based on the fact that our step sizes are gonna be small enough, um, we just need to identify, well, how many do we need to take and how would you argue, you know, take this many, but don't take more than that because you don't wanna end up, um, you don't wanna end up taking too many steps and then, you know, ending up over here and getting a number right there. That's not between and that means you've gone too far. So basically what we've got here, um, and this is gonna be a sketch of a proof. If you wanna see the formal write-up of the proof, you can just take a look at the textbook. Um, but really the, the key is, is given zero less than x less than y, by the Archimedean property part two, there has to exist a natural number such that zero is less than one over n, which is less than y minus x. This is because y minus x is a positive number. And AP part two says, when you have a positive number, you can divide by a large enough natural number such that one over n is smaller than that. Okay, now what I'm gonna do to guarantee that I don't, that I go far enough, that I take enough steps to get into the interval, but don't go too far, I am going to use uh, the Archimedean property part one to get the smallest integer m such that m is less than or equal, or sorry, m minus one is less than or equal to x times m and that's less than m. Notice what this is doing for me is it's guaranteeing we've got two sides of our inequality. I'm gonna label them. I'm gonna label the second, second piece inequality one and the first piece inequality two. The second piece of this inequality, um, if I focus on it, so I'll highlight it, this tells me um, It says, you know, that xn is less than m, but that implies that x is less than m over n. So that gets me the condition that the number I found is greater than x. So I've gotten, remember I need a double-sided inequality up here. I'm looking for an r in between x and y. Right now I've made sure I've gone past x. The fact that I have chosen the smallest integer um, and it, I guess you could technically get away with not calling this the smallest integer. You just wanna choose the integer such that m minus one is less than or equal to x times n, um, but m is strictly bigger. So it's like you're finding that threshold. And you want this, uh, sec this inequality that I've labeled it as one to be strict so that when you rearrange, you get m over n strictly bigger than x. So it may be that x times n is an integer, but that would be your m minus one value. Now, inequality two is what guarantees that we haven't gone too far. Meaning, when you look at m over n, so we need to show that m over n is less than y. That's our goal. Now remember, the way we decided um, that we were gonna make sure we didn't go too far was to take these, uh, was to one, choose our inequality um, using this integer m, such that m minus one is less than or equal to x times n, but m is larger. And the second thing was we guaranteed that we were not taking step sizes that were too big. So, what we're gonna do is take inequality two and combine it with the fact that our step sizes were chosen small enough in order to produce this uh, inequality. 
So what we know is m minus 1 divided by n has to be less than or equal to x. That's just taking inequality 2 and dividing n to, uh, from both sides. But remember, this is related not just to the value of m that we've chosen, it's also related to the size of 1 over n. And what I can do to make sure I see how a 1 over n is playing a role in this is I could split up that fraction across the denominator because then I actually see 1 over n. And then I can rearrange because the reason I would be thinking to do this would be because, remember what we're trying to do, we're trying to prove an inequality that involves m over n and y. And right now I don't have y and I need to get it in there somewhere. Well, that's where this inequality of how we chose our step size comes in. Because x plus 1 over n, that's strictly less than using x plus y minus x instead. All I'm doing is using a comparison between 1 over n and y minus x. I've made a replacement of a smaller number with a larger number, so transitively my inequality grows, and notice that that's just y. And at one point right here, the inequality becomes strict, so therefore I've shown that y is strictly greater than m over n. So putting this together, x is less than m over n, which is less than y. Let r equal m over n. That's an r. And note that r is in q by construction. n was a natural number, so we know it's an integer that's not 0. And m was chosen to be an integer. So that is the proof.